Ray, uh, very honored to have you here uh, and um, to, to, to share our conversations here also with the wider audience. Uh, no, we don't have uh, client slides. <laughs> it's just a coast of fire. So, um, uh, so again, welcome and uh, thanks, Thank for, you. thanks for coming over. Um, so, so I think we, we met online uh, like four years ago. Yes. I, got a, I got a mail, I saw a mail from Ray Ozzy on the email address I had on GitHub. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a different mail and, and, and I thought uh, I, I, it was 2016. I'm like, why is somebody nowadays sending mails longer than, uh, than, than five lines? So like <laughs> doing it away and then Johan called me and said, hey, the inventor of uh, Lotus Notes just sent us a mail. I said, eh, Lotus Notes? <laughs> right? So uh, maybe you can pick up the introduction there, but that's how we met. And uh, yeah, I think we had some great conversations on, on uh, our shared passion of uh, low power YDR in networks. Uh, but yeah, can you, can you introduce yourself maybe shortly to the others? Sure. Um, I've been in the software industry for uh, a very, very, very long time. Uh, I worked on some products that you might have heard of or maybe your parents heard of. Uh, uh, VisiCalc, Lotus123, Lotus Notes. Um, uh, um, I've done, depending on how you count, you know, six or eight startups. Um, uh, I, because I was in the personal computer industry very, very early, and it was a very small industry, um, I got an opportunity to meet and know most of the uh, larger players. Um, uh, and, um, but I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training. Um, uh, I've been fortunate to have worked on products that had broad success and uh, that changes you when you are fortunate enough to, to do that. It, it tends to give you a mindset of scale. Um, uh, you tend to do pattern matching and approach problems, trying to say, how can I have the greatest impact on the largest number of users or the greatest impact on the largest number of partners and businesses that, that they might, uh, might create. Um, uh, the reason that uh, we met um, was because uh, just after I had uh, left Microsoft, I uh, um, was involved in a project that some of you who might have been here last year might have heard of, I think. Yeah. Here. Uh, had spoken about there's a, a nonprofit called Safecast, and we were making uh, um, this was a nonprofit created in the wake of Fukushima to uh, deliver radiation data within weeks of the of the meltdown um, to the citizens who really had no idea if they were safe or not safe and so on. And I learned a lot um, uh, from that project uh, about IoT, about technology in general. And we were trying to make a, a, um, a solar-powered uh, sensor uh, that used um, some kind of network as a backhaul uh, to get the data out of the exclusion zone. And LoRa uh, looked like the perfect solution at the time, and that's how uh, that's why I kind of reached out because yeah. this was the uh, the center of excellence for for LoRa. Ah, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so can, can you tell a bit about? Um uh, so, so, so with all this experience you have over this, all these different technology cycles over the, over the last decades, like, like what's your, can you give a general perspective on, on low power wide area networks and what, what are, your, what are your, your ideas and do you see any resemblance towards anything sure. else? Um, there are some resemblances and some differences. The, um, uh, I think I started reading about um, the potential of IoT in general, probably maybe eight years ago or so. I mean, it was a it was a very a very long time ago, and um, a, every year seems to be uh, seems to continue the promises of this is going to be an unbelievably massive market, huge market. Everybody agrees on it. You can see customer use cases. You can see the customer value, um, but it but it still seems to take longer. Um, the last time that that occurred in my career uh, was pr predominantly this thing that we call the year of the LAN. Um, uh, in the early 1990s, people could foresee that personal computers 
would be connected into networks. And every year, um, uh, people said this was going to be the year. And VCs initially uh, invested in companies um, that ended up not panning out because the, that year kept um, uh, uh, delaying. But obviously, it happened. Um, obviously, at, at, at some point, we all had PCs. They were all connected. Lands went from the workplace into into home. Then the then the internet happened. Um, so in that in that way, it's similar. And I think in some ways that impacts um, investor mentality uh, when the time frame of the investment cycle uh, doesn't necessarily match a predictable time frame of the market cycle. Um, where it doesn't match um, is that. What are the obstacles to, uh, to uh, broad IoT deployment? Um, I think in many cases, uh, what the customer really wants is they want um, systems that match the way that they build their, their, the rest of their IT systems. Um, they, they build in-house systems by having a concept or a requirement, asking someone to prototype it, refine that prototype very quickly, and then uh, deploy it. And they don't understand the, the skill level within enterprises um, and businesses of all sizes is not quite up to the level yet where they can treat the physical deployment of IoT uh, just like their in-house in IoT systems. And so I think the, the biggest variable in my mind and the, big, the biggest challenge and opportunity for us as, as vendors is to try to uh, find ways to make IoT deployments so simple that you can iterate them very, very quickly, uh, whether it's new types of device or uh, stock types of device with new usage scenarios and so on. Yeah. So, 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 so I, I, what we discussed um, uh, before is also like the fragmentation in the market. So what you're saying with the LAN Things like that that people made made connectors and maybe even cables that were were not interoperable. Well, there were there were definitely at the time. It's hard to remember this at the time, but in the early land days, there were multiple competing technologies. There was uh, uh, multiple uh, plugs, right? You had to, like the very right. long printer plugs. plugs. There was to IBM token ring. There was a, a token passing bus that Cynet or SciTech or somebody did. Um, there was Ethernet, which is another, uh, at the time it was on a, uh, there was thick Ethernet. The and, coax, and Ethernet uh, coax cables. Coax, yeah. right. And it just hadn't settled out yet. Um, but also there were, there were other challenges. Um, it's very difficult for people to remember this, but um, many physical buildings were built such that you couldn't get cables between, yeah. between the rooms. And just... The concept of wiring up an office um, in an old building was just insane. It, yeah. it would take nine months or a year. But, but it's interesting because there you see the resemblance that, that actually the IT needed OT. That's it right. was very, very basic, like facility management OT, which is stopping the... the and I, I think that's something we see now in the market as well, uh, is, that, is that, that the OT part and the logistical part of the IoT is actually... Uh, the, the largest total cost of ownership driver. That's right. Um, I so you, you could argue that also there, there's a difference in the analogy that, that, um, uh, that you could say that there, there was actually, you might be able to predict at that time, there was one technology to win it all. That's right. Right, because it was so physical. Yep. And now we're, we, like with a spectrum is a, is a, is a, is a common ground. It's, it's an unpredictable uh, area. Um, so, so do you think do you think it's a it's a winner takes all in IoT? What, what, what's your perspective? Well, let's just uh, let's just um, uh, break down just two dimensions of IoT. I think we already know, even without talking about LP WAN, just about IoT in general. There's already a very big divide that we don't communicate very well between um, more or less the the hardware that is good for edge compute, and that is single board computers, mm -hmm. little Linux-based Raspberry Pi uh, types of, of processors, uh, things with memory management and, and Linux. And, and those, uh, those tools are very familiar 
for cloud developers because the whole tool chain, development tool chain is the same. The other piece is microcontroller based um, IoT devices. The, um, the, the former, the, the, uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi ones, are probably going to have success in the millions of units a year. The microcontroller ones are probably going to have success in the tens of millions of, or maybe even hundreds of millions of units a year because the costs are, are lower and, and, and so on. Um, on the, on the uh, communications dimension, um, it is absolutely not going to be a winner take all. There are uh, different characteristics of um, uh, LoRa, LoRaWAN, um, Bluetooth, you know, mesh form of Bluetooth, cellular, uh, you know, whether it's cellular, you know, Cat M or Cat NB. Even in cellular, there's pri there's there are future private CBRS, uh, you know, unlicensed deployments of LTE technologies and not. And so, I don't think it's going to be highly fragmented, but I think it's going to settle out that we will look at use cases and say this use case uses cellular for backhaul and LoRa for um, uh, the, 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 the last you know, uh, half mile or mile you know, to the sensors. Or in this other application, um, it's mobile, so it'll use um, uh, a high, uh, CAD M or you know, something like that. Yeah. We, we will find design patterns, much as we do in the rest of architecture, picking the right pattern for the right application. Yeah. So, so if I would summarize that as um, that, that you would, for certain fragments in the market and segments, you would have then also a fragment te technology landscape. That's right. Um, and I, I think we would argue that, that because you have these different fragments, you're also starting to uh, lose out on the network effect you have with IP, you have with Wi-Fi. Um, and, and, and actually, that's an extra argument to implement features that then enhance network effect for growth. Right? Because otherwise, if you do that, then, um, then, then you get even more silos, right? Like then you get it, yeah, like you do fragmentation times fragmentation, and then there's a, there's a huge mess. I, I think that's also what the current state of the market is. So, so, um, but so, toward that, but, but, yep. but just following up on that point, um, uh, as our industry matures, um, I'm hoping that we see, um, NBIoT and uh, and CADM solutions mixed in with you know the, the exact same uh, uh, booths and yeah. you know customer scenarios because I think all of us could benefit when talking to customers to help them understand what the right yeah. um, you know answer is is for each one. But but yeah, and in that sense, so 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 if we then gonna mix and match, that's right. Uh, interoperable interfaces are even more key. That's right? Right. because um, you don't want to be locked into a, uh, let's say, a Laura uh, 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 fan, uh, bo girl and yep. boy organization. Yep. I, think, I, th I think one other thing that I think we, um, and I know there are customers here and vendors, but speaking to vendors, um, uh, I think we sometimes lose sight of the fact that um, many customers all, all, all they really care about is what happens on their device and what happens in the cloud. Everything else in the middle is overhead. And we get enamored with the technology of, and the platforms and things like that in the middle. Uh, those platforms, when, they, uh, when the solution or the customer needs interoperability, for example, in smart cities applications, it is important to have some kind of a platform definition. But for many customers, they just want to rapidly get the solution yeah. out there, and they don't want a platform. They just, yeah. they, you know, that, that's the last thing they want. They just want the data that they create at the, at the sensor to be delivered in the cloud, yeah. and, and that's it. Yeah, but that's not the current state of the market, right? Like, like what mm -hmm. you see is there's a lot of horizontal selling, mm -hmm. and there is also horizontal uh, marketing mm -hmm. as well, which I think always like IoT is there when you stop talking about IoT. Right, right, uh, and um, uh, and 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 is in this maturity curve, like we're on the way, but um, but exactly, like if you if you really, in the majority of the cases, start talking uh, vertically, uh, talking about use cases, then then you're there, and what's under the hood, 
doesn't really matter as long as it right. can meet your SLA. Uh, uh, so yeah, thanks for this, uh, this um, uh, sharing your ideas on that. This. So then if you look, so then if we say that there is still room for growing in maturity, um, what are the market uh, making activities? Let it be ecosystem building, let it be VCs stepping in or strategic investors in. So what do you think needs to, will push that uh, uh, increase in maturity in the next like three to five years? Like what, like what do yeah. we, what do we need to implement? Um, based on what I've seen, um, uh, number one, I think uh, VCs don't want another IoT platform. Uh, yeah. They, I think the, what they're thinking is, um, what has a good likelihood of a repeatable go-to-market, of, of a repeatable sales motion? So if you have a strong vertical, um, maybe it's agriculture, maybe it's um, uh, managing, uh, uh, maybe it's transportation, uh, uh, you know, tracking, uh, maybe it's pallets, uh, you know, the, the more you can focus on something and convey to, a, to an investor that you will be able to scale, um, you know, either linearly or non-linearly scale um, this, this solution that you've done, there is a much higher likelihood of capturing that investor interest uh, than there is in pitching horizontal growth. Um, yeah. That's my opinion right now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, um, so I think also if you look at investment in the market and um, uh, you Google that, it, it's actually pretty low. Like, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of that? Like, what's your perspective on what's happening there? I'm sorry. The, the, so the investment levels in IoT is very low. It's like it's more, it would say, robotics or AI, whatever that may be. Or uh, well, I, as I said, I think there was a bubble of investment probably eight years ago when people thought it was going to grow really fast. At this point in time, um, uh, what it's going to take is certain verticals to start taking off and then that investment appetite uh, will come again. But I do think there are classes of investors right now. There are a lot of investors out there. There's a huge amount of capital that doesn't, you know, that's parked right now. Um, if you can show um, uh, that you've got a solution that has the promise of getting some momentum, I really do believe that will be the the, the potential beginning of another wave of investment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. So, so um, uh, what's your perspective on, uh, on, on, on open source and APIs uh, in this IoT ecosystem? Where, where, where do you think it fits or um, yeah, where do you think it's effective and where do you think it's not effective? I think um, at this point in history, um, open source is just assumed by all developers. You assume that um, you'll be able to, to find code on GitHub or GitLab, you know, so, somewhere out there. You'll be able to find many examples of, of what you do. You'll be able to interact with the developers. Um, there is experimentation with license models. There's no question about that. You know, some of the companies that I deal with have these, you know, have tri are trying and have tried open core models. Some, uh, you know, are GPL, dual licensed, you know, having a GPL version that people can use, but, you know, kind of reserve some way of capturing uh, uh, revenues on the, on the enterprise side. But at this point in time, it's kind of essential to convey to the developer how it works by having, you know, a vast amount um, uh, of open source. Doesn't mean every component of the system um, has to be open source, but but certainly uh, yeah. a high degree of it does. Yeah, now, yeah of course we believe that as well. And I, th I think the, the, the fact that from the almost 8 billion people in the world, there are only 20 million that can program, making the lives of these 20 million more effective will always is benefit the market growth. Yep. That's also our, our uh, and, and, if, and, uh, and uh, yeah, as a marketing tool, it's yep. of course also very effective. It's also important though to remember, it, I, I keep focusing on simplification. 
in order for the, the, there to be growth, um, there is a wave of, that started some number of years ago of everything as a service. Um, uh, uh, and you know, sometimes people think of that from a consumer perspective, but many in-house IT systems now uh, that people used to run internally. HR systems have been taken over by Workday. Um, uh, you know, Salesforce has taken over a lot of the CRM duties. Um, there is a place for um, raising the, the bar on how, how we provide IoT deployment as a service. Um, you have to get the trust of the vendor uh, uh, sorry, the, the trust of the customer that you're not going to go away, and maybe that's through open source. But if you can get their trust, I really do believe that that they would, the majority of them would rather consume it as a service, just because it takes skills to operate mm -hmm. the, this infrastructure. Yeah, and there again, you have the scarce resource, and yep. and the make or buy, of course, is always very easy. Yeah, so. Um, um, uh, talking a bit about, about what you did at SafeCast, I like, I, I mean, it's such an inspiring project in Japan. Uh, 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 can you tell a bit more about that? What's the current status? Maybe for people who hear that, uh, how's that going? Yeah. So SafeCast is doing great. Uh, it's uh, I'm a director of the of the of the uh, organization. It's very small. It has two or three full-time employees, and depending on how you count it, you, it's probably 10,000 volunteers. It's, a, um, uh, it's an extremely um, uh, uh, successful citizen data project. Everything that uh, is done for the project is open source and Creative Commons zero op you know, open data. Um, many people are there because uh, they're, they, they enjoy working with the other people on the project and they learn about technology and about community process and so on from, you know, from the other people. I'm sure that many of your community members are you know, involved in your mm. community uh, for the same reasons. Um, I myself have gotten uh, uh, quite a bit out of it. One of the devices that we uh, created was a dual stack LoRa and cellular um, uh, communication back channel for the device. And the cellular piece was extremely, extremely difficult because of the power management mm. aspects of it. And so uh, I've created a startup called Blues Wireless that is trying to simplify the, the cellular IoT piece of it for narrowband cellular so that it is hopefully as simple as you know, some of these other modules are for non-cellular uh, technologies. And that's including the business model um, uh, I, I don't believe that for, for many of the low cost IoT applications, I believe many of them, uh, the cost of managing SIMs and managing subscriptions and things like that may dominate the value of mm. the actual app. And so the, the, the way that I'm, I'm trying to, I'm testing this as, as we bring it to market is essentially that all the bandwidth that you will need is embedded in the cost of the module that you, yeah. that you put in. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all for every application, but I, I'm a deep believer in massive IoT. I just think there are going to, there's going to be connectivity in everything and uh, giving them more options uh, in terms of different transports, I think is a good thing. Ah, super interesting. So, um, um, and so, so with this, this, this new product, you're simplifying the whole end-to-end -end, uh, uh, solution and, uh, and, and, and yeah, interesting because I work. I worked. I worked myself at the telco, and um, the, the complexity of the of the of the BSS and the OSS uh, layers it was it's unbelievable, and how that would drive up the cost of of, of, of your phone bill. And if you can simplify that, that's that's, uh, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, is there uh, without um, uh, is there a way how you where you can share a bit of because you have this hands-on experience with both. Right, that's a, so uh, well, and we, I, I, don't, I don't want to go into no, like uh, and we've built gateways sorry uh, and we built LoRa gateway yeah. so that essentially you can have a a, a, lo a local LoRa network and just use one of these uh, fixed price cellular 
things as a backhaul, oh, nice. um, if you like. I think, again, I don't believe there is a one-size-fits-all solution to all these things. That so, so okay, if you st because you have hands-on experience, so w what would you say with segments? Um, because you say, of course, as a, as a backhaul, it's interesting. But are there any other comparisons you say, okay, where you think, okay, that segment will... It's comparisons between the two technologies yeah. or things. So, um, CAD-M, let's just start at the highest end, um, LTE CAD-M is an amazing technology for tracking because it supports mobility and you can get, uh, you know, the combination of having tower locations almost for free when you connect to the tower uh, for an approximate regional, you know, mm -hmm. aspect and the fact that the modems uh, come with GPS uh, uh, in it for fr okay. more or yeah. less for free. Um, it's a good, it's a very good tracking solution for uh, for mobile applications. NB is, uh, but it's very power hungry. So you have to keep the modem turned off almost all the time. Okay, yeah. You just cannot be, you have to do a lot of buffering but, and then just decide that you're gonna turn on the cellular, transmit, receive, and then, you know, shut it down. Um, NB is uh, lower power. Um, it's fixed only. It, it, it doesn't really uh, work for mobile, but it's extremely difficult to configure. Uh, mm. It's very, um, it's, let's say it this way, it's, it's from what I've seen, it's um, because there, it's new, there are many operators who have done different deployments and it's very, finicky in terms of, uh, uh, it's not like your cell phone where you can turn it on and it just, just works. You have to find out what band and, 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 you know, and, and so on. It involves much more configuration. LoRa is both dramatically lower power and dramatically lower cost because both the, um, regardless of what the cell industry would say, um, the, the lowest cost you're going to get for the communications part of a module involving cellular starts at around $10. Mm, it's okay. not, or $10 US or And that's, that's the motor. I mean, you can get a little bit cheaper module, but then you have to add a SIM card, the cost of a SIM card, and then you've got, you know, a uh, data plan. And, and this is a telco certified module, the $10. That's the right. certification is included. That's right. Okay. Uh, and, but, but there are, there's a lot of innovation happening right now. Nordic, uh, just, just as here, ST um, has shown that integration of the MCU and LoRa is a good thing and it's gonna happen. There is also integration uh, between uh, cellular modems and MCUs, like Nordic has the NRF uh, 91. This integration and everything driving toward being on a SIP um, is just gonna happen more and more because everyone sees that uh, massive IoT is going to be a hundred billion unit market, and I, I really believe it. I don't know what time frame, um, but I, I, I really believe it's it's, yeah. it's going to be huge. Yeah. So 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 then um, then moving on to the, the module to the hardware. I mean, our, we have burned our fingers on a few hardware projects uh, very publicly, actually, um, and and looking at these time frames, sometimes sometimes like the the what I think is that if you look at the full chain, your risk reward as a device maker, you actually, you're not being rewarded enough. So one of, one <laughs> of, that, so yeah. one of the things that, that, that going to be focused for us for 2020 is, is that, that we don't have uh, millions on the bank, of course, to, to increase the reward, but we have tools to, to, to reduce the risk. Wonderful. And to get that out of in, in balance. So, so, and then uh, the complexity with the different MCU ecosystems. So, so what, what's, your, what's your ideas on that? I think that's hugely important. I think that um, for many, many customers who are not tech companies, but who see how they can transform their business, um, having viable retrofit solutions um, uh, can really get them in the game uh, uh, with a much lower risk. So if, there, if you have a palette of um, hardware solutions that might have different GPI or different I.O. so that you could more easily connect them with existing equipment or, or 
equipment that um, only would require slight firmware modifications to emit data, mm -hmm. and you can be kind of the intermediary so that they don't have to build the whole device. Maybe at the, if they could exist at the scripting level and do some simple scripts to do that inter interface, I think that could get a lot of customers going. We have uh, um, a lot of meetings with a, um, a number of companies, and um, uh, as an example, right now a lot of refrigerator manufacturers as a very specific example, um, uh, they ha everything has microcontrollers in it, yeah. but they would like to uh, make sure that they send service people out to service commercial refrigerators um, before the customer has the opportunity to, to experience a failure and to get a call. They can't get the customer to subsidize um, the upstream connection, so they want things cheap enough that they can have every refrigerator they sell connected to the cloud so that they can help the customer. Um, and that's, that's the, the big opportunity there, again, is retrofit, because they don't want to redesign every single one of their models of product, yeah. just have connectivity. They want to say, okay, I've got a microcontroller, what can I send it out? Yeah. And I think that will occur. These brownfield applications, there's a huge amount of... of, uh, of Refrigerators, toasters, microwaves. Yeah, no, and, and it's, it's, uh, also there is a, a, I think also um, a competence ecosystem. So we, we've been talking to, to like this 8-bit this mm -hmm. ecosystem as well, like mm -hmm. this typically, but the, like an 8-bit processor, like this, you cannot run an activity, a connectivity stack on that. So there needs this simplification uh, and also um, it, it needs a, a framing as well, what we saw, because, because they're, they're totally not, they, they're thinking in bill of material. Right. It, that's, that's, they, they've been thinking that for two decades. Right. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting field. I, I, think we, I think as an industry, we really should be attack, trying to attack this from two, two aspects. One, what are the most common retrofit scenarios and how can we help those people along? And number two, how can we increase the competency um, of the industry to be able to quickly spin um, concepts so that it isn't a, a really long, laborious yeah. process. If we can, you know, I, I think everyone, it's common knowledge to people here that the whole Shenzhen ecosystem has more or less, you know, turned hardware into a service if you have the competency uh, to spin a board, to do the basic layout, to spin a board, to have access to an electrical engineer who will uh, get it right, the, mostly the first or second you know, yeah. spin. You can do amazing things, but we need to kind of make it more accessible. Yeah, and also uh, show them where, where's the end game, right? So like right. now you have a sensor and a refrigerator and maybe cost you $30. Mm -hmm. Then you have a module that costs 10 and then the chip down is gonna be five. Right. But it, and I think that that story could be told more and also the framing around it. We, was like we were sitting with somebody who was doing an 8-bit and I said, just see it as a long-range LED, mm -hmm. right? So right. This, is, this is an LED, right. like just say on, off, yes, no, good, bad. That's right. And, and, uh, and it's not an LED that shows it to somebody that's in the room. It's telling like, it to somebody on the other side of the world. And it's even better because nobody can see, yeah. see what the data is. But uh, yeah. No, that's, that's a great analogy. Yeah. So... so um, we're out of time, actually. <laughs> All right. Let's finish, finish up then with the long-range LED metaphor. And uh, I want to thank you very, very much for sharing, sharing your, your ideas on stage. And um, um, yeah, that's it. My pleasure. And thanks what you've done for what you've done to, with the community and to kind of up-level uh, all of our uh, knowledge about, you know, what the potential of LP1 is. Thank you very much. Yep.